welcome to this short clip on Romanticism. Uh, you're going to need to be familiar with this concept so that um, you can better understand some of the texts that we will be or have been studying in class. Now, by way of introduction, uh, this film clip is going to give you a little bit of insight into the key elements that are true to Romanticism. We are going to take a look at its origins and the context from which Romanticism developed. And we're also going to uh, have an insight into the key influences that shaped the worldview of Romantic composers. And of course, I'll also be rehashing on how their texts convey the values and perceptions of their world. At the very end, I will also be listing um, the key characteristics that you will find are common in Romantic texts. And it might be uh, clear that these uh, exist in the texts that we're doing in class. But before we begin, uh, there's a few things that you need to have prepared in order to get the most out of this presentation. Now, firstly, I would encourage you to have pen and writing paper ready. And this is obviously for note taking. I am going to be giving a little bit more detail on some of the points that you'll see on screen and of course this will help you to get a more comprehensive understanding of the concept of Romanticism. Of course you can uh, pause and play your presentation as many times as you like uh, in order to uh, be able to write down the notes that you need. And I would also encourage you to have your class notes readily accessible just in case you want to cross-reference or add relevant details to your study notes. Uh, one of the things that you should do also is to keep in mind the text that we're studying and try to find some links um, across the text and Think about how the context of Romanticism and classical thinking may contribute to a better understanding of those texts. Now, as you're writing your notes, I would suggest that you don't write down everything I say word for word, but rather you write them in your own words. It's important for you to express your own understanding, of course, in your own style. And this is going to help you later on when you're developing your own thesis statements and arguments for your extended responses. And of course, lastly, um, if you have any questions that need clarification um, from this clip or even uh, links that you may have come across between what I've discussed today and the text that we're doing in class, write them down and bring them into class, we'll have a, a discussion about those. Now, if you've got all of this organised, we're going to get started, but if you don't, this might be a really good time to pause the presentation and get those things together. We're going to start by looking at the term Romanticism. What is it? What elements does it entail? Where did it come from? Well, first of all, it's important for you to know that Romanticism has many interpretations and definitions, and this is very much dependent on context. However, generally speaking, Romanticism is a term that refers to a European-wide revolution in literature, art, music and other forms that were characteristic from approximately 1750 to about 1840. These forms of expression conveyed the new ways of thinking that stemmed from a classical, um, a rejection rather, of classical ideals. And composers conveyed their romantic perspectives through their unconventional representations of their world and the things that influenced those views. The word romantic did have different meanings um, across the ages. And in the 17th century, it certainly had connotations um, in literature and art that conformed to forms of expression that were particularly imaginative. Um, they bordered on fictitious and were extravagant. 
Yet by the 18th century, it came to mean a lot more than that. Uh, by the 18th century, it came to signify an innate connection between man and nature, with texts reflecting on the wondrous wilderness of natural settings. In 1755, a man by the name of Dr Samuel Johnson defined the term romantic as, and I quote, resembling the tales or romances, wild, improbable, false, fanciful, and full of wild scenery. Now, it was in these settings where heroes and heroines of romantic tales, as well as the poets, artists, and musicians of the romantic period, um, would seek spiritual truth and encounter deeply profound experiences. Now, you may find that all of these elements are true in the text that we're looking at in class. And hopefully this context and this background information is going to give you a little bit more understanding of the purpose um, of the text and, of course, how meaning is shaped throughout it. In order for us to understand Romanticism even better, we really need to delve into its origins, how it started, how it developed, and the context from which it was born. Now, the Romanticism movement developed significantly over a period of time. And this was influenced by key political, philosophical, and social events and attitudes. It is important to notice here that Romantics were distinguished from Romance writers. Now, romance writers were mostly concerned with sentimental love stories. And even though romantics did explore the experience of love and passion and strong emotion, romantics, spelt with a capital R, uh, were actually more focused on the celebration, praise and contemplation of all things that made up the beauty of the world uh, in all its wild, unexplainable and naturally occurring forms. Originally, the term romance was actually used to describe medieval verse and occasionally prose tales. Um, and it was these tales that often concerned uh, quests of chivalry and were written in one of the romance languages that derived from Latin. Now, languages um, included French, Italian, Portuguese and Spanish. These tales were typically characterised by highly imaginative and heroic adventures, which featured feminine uh, vulnerability and honour, as well as celebrating knightly qualities. Tales like these became key elements for writers such as Mary Shelley and Lord Byron, who himself went on a quest in 1823 to help the Greeks in their fight for independence from the Turks. Now, by 18th century, um, stories that took place in picturesque or wild and exotic settings tended to be referred to as romantic, and an emphasis on these places continued to become more and more distinctive. From the Renaissance onwards, the word romantic had often been used to condemn overly imaginative artistic expression, which was understood to challenge um, classical ideals which were popular at the time. Now, in order for us to really understand the context, we really need to have a look at the Renaissance period and the uh, traditional thinking that existed at that time. Now, I've referred to this way of thinking as the classical worldview so far. So let's have a look at that. Now, the arrival of the Tudors on the throne in, in England in about 1485 marked a period of dramatic reform. Um, which set the scene for what was to become a really dominant cultural force at this time. Now, this period, the Renaissance, um, spanned between about the 14th and 17th century. 
Um, and of course, it indicated the rebirth of learning, um, which was inspired by the ideals originating from Greek and Roman societies. This era is also referred to, of course, as the Age of Enlightenment and the Age of Reason. And this is because um, of its adherents' strong interest in rational and scientific inquiry as a means of achieving an ideal and harmonious society and understanding the nature of a being human. Enlightenment thinkers gained a strong admiration for structural order, symmetrical proportion and social harmony through their rediscovery of classical literature, arts and philosophy, which stemmed from classical Greece and Rome. Now, this ever-increasing respect and celebration of intellect and logical thinking really reached its height in the late 17th century, and it became known as neoclassicism, which affirmed the neo or newly developed manifestation of these classical influences. In terms of artistic expression, rationalist uh, philosophers such as Descartes and Locke, as well as scientists like Isaac Newton, valued the rational intellect um, and logical conventions that um, typified this new way of thinking to explore and understand their own world. Such ideals certainly filtered right through into all aspects of society and these were particularly reflected in politics, the arts, literature and of course even architecture as seen here with the Ionic and Doric architectural styles which were borrowed from classical buildings, um, becoming popular features of stately homes and palaces at the time. Of course, the Romantics, by comparison, viewed the world from a really different perspective. They really rejected all of these um, intellectual, uh, intellectual uh, rational ways of looking at the world and focused instead uh, on the importance of human experience and feelings, the imagination and the individual freedom of expression. Now these ideals were certainly um, represented in romantic uh, literature and art as seen here in this painting by William Blake uh, from approximately 1795. Now, as you see here, the painting portrays the famous 18th century scientist, Sir Isaac Newton, and he's deeply engrossed in precise calculation. The diagram upon which he's working may be useful, but from the romantic point of view, it is not something that a human can deeply engage in. It is not a living thing. It's clear that Newton is so focused on the process of rational and scientific inquiry that he is oblivious to the wonder of the wilderness around him, as well as the essence of his own personal natural state, um, which is represented, of course, by his nudity. The composition here reflects romantic condemnation of scientific rationalism, which, although progressive and useful, was actually considered to have severe limitations for the individual. In particular, Blake's painting symbolically exposes the idea that such limitations include the loss of human interaction with and the acknowledgement of their own personal emotions, um, their spirituality and their imagination, all of which, of course, remain suppressed. So, in simple terms, Romanticism really was a reaction against the classical and, of course, it challenges the neoclassical way of thinking that had become popular. Art historian David Blaney Brown described this rejection of neoclassical thinking as, quote, a great tide on the turn, uh, and this saw 
philosophical inquiry shift from the objective to the subjective. Um, it was a model that explored potential and instinct rather than the conscious mind. Um, it looked at integrity rather than obedience and it celebrated the wonder of suffering, sorrow, fear and joy rather than simply logical thinking. Um, and of course it also um, hosted the idea of the humble and natural rather than the calculated and sophisticated. Romantics also negated the popular belief that science could explain everything concerning human beings. Um, they rejected this and instead they were inspired by the natural world, the individual and his emotional experience, the imagination and freedom of expression to explore and better understanding, uh, understand the nature of being human. In the arts, for example, romantics challenged um, the purity of form and subject matter, uh, which were upheld by their classical counterparts. Um, Shakespeare and his English contemporaries frequently broke Aristotle's classical rules of the dramatic unities, um, which dictated that uh, the action of a play must be be limited to just one place, one day, and one plot. Romantics didn't um, follow this rule. In fact, they opted to include action that took place in multiple locations, sometimes even simultaneously, uh, as well as exploring multiple subplots that spanned across multiple time frames and realities, such as dream states and fantasy worlds. And of course, we see these across um, many of Shakespeare's plays. Now this freedom of expression um, was mostly frowned upon by classical playwrights who of course valued um, and exercised control of thought, order, clarity and precision in their works. Now to wrap up um, this was really the context from which um, Romanticism uh, really came from. And these are the elements that contribute to the worldview um, held by Romantic composers. Now, when you're thinking about your text that we're studying in class, you may find that some of the elements I've mentioned are very much clear within them. And um, it's important for you to remember that Romanticism is characterised by some key features which shape that unique way of thinking. The following list of features is not a definitive um, list that characterises um, the Romantic way of thinking but it does capture the focus as, as aspects of Romanticism. So when you're thinking about your text, you might find that um, it includes some of these features. We know that Romantic um, texts deal with the importance of inspiration. It also delves into the potential of one's imagination, intuition, and it celebrates the importance of individuality. And lastly, of course, it seeks to maintain the sense of idealism of our world. It is important to note that um, the following characteristics are no more important uh, than the other and as such they're emphasised more strongly by some romantic composers compared to others. Now that was just a very quick overview of the characteristics but for more um, detailed insight you will need to watch the film clip called Romanticism, Ideas and Characteristics in Text and that will help you to better understand these elements um, and how they link to the text that we're doing in class.
But for now, I hope that this has helped you understand the concept of romanticism. And I thank you very much for watching. I hope that um, you are able to um, do some research of your own. But in the meantime, here are a quick list of some of the texts that I use for this presentation. Hope you enjoyed. Have a great day.